Hello, this is Haku the Bean, and I am here with five SCPs. 10, 11, wait, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, six SCPs. I hope that uh, you enjoyed this. If you do, please leave a like, please comment on the video, and please subscribe to the channel. Item number, SCP-10, object class, safe. This SCP is also known as the uh, Allers of Control. The objects comprising SCP-10 are to be kept in numbered locked boxes at Site-19. They are not to be worn except by test subjects. SCP-10 are only to be removed from storage for testing. SCP-10 consists of a series of six apparently identical cast iron collars with numbered metal tags and one remote control. The control is SCP-10-1. The collars are SCP-10-2 through SCP-10-7. The collars contain intricate electronic components and are powered by small... Oh, five... I remember the diameter to your this. Thick 100 volt batteries. These batteries are rechargeable. The remote is a heavy black box resembling an old style handheld radio transmitter or, or receiver with a primitive blue white cathode ray screen and a series of more than 100 unlabeled buttons, as well as a frequency tuner. The trial while in error, the frequency of all six currently found callers have been discovered. A label in Russian is stamped into the metal along with a logo consisting of workers building a pyramid. No official Russian incorporation or government agency uses its logo or matches the words stamped into the metal. Placing the collar around the neck of a person and securing it allows one to control their every movement with the remote. It is also capable of producing an an adrenal response and activating or deactivating the sympathetic nervous system. The most abnormal features of the, the collars is the effect they have on the body morphologically. They allow the user of, of the remote to reconfigure the shape of the victim to an extent that is apparently only limited by the knowledge of the programming language of the remote. Addendum 10-1 SCP-10 was discovered or in the basement of a lone man in the Midwestern United States after a local disappearance was connected to him. When the police raided the man's house, they found SCP-10 as well as several dead bodies. One of the bodies was identified to be the man. The others were or several other missing persons. Cause of death seems to be mass suicide. However, there were signs of significant struggle first. Addendum 10-2. This is simple experiment. Test 1. SCP-10 and 2 taken apart piecewise. A parts labeled and several photographs have taken, then reassembled. After reassembly, SCP-10-2 continues to function. Test 2. SCP-10-8 constructed identical to SCP-10-2 with the closest approximations available to the unrecoverable components. Result SCP 10 8 fails to function. Test 3 Unreplicable components from SCP 10 2 placed into proper locations of SCP 10 8. Result SCP 10 2 ceases function with removal of components. SCP-10-8 begins functioning. Test 4. Components return to SCP-10-2. 
replicable components in an SCP-102 replaced with replicas. Result, SCP-102 begins functioning with return of, of components. Changing recept replicable old components for a replica does not significantly reduce functionality. Replacement of a dim image transistor decreases time from transmission to effect of SCP-102 responsive commands entered at any remote by 12%. SCP-10-3, I mean, no, Addendum 10-3. SCP-10 has been demonstrated to work more effectively in creating unskilled labor than and for any other task. The logo is apt. You can see why I'm doing five of these in one video. That was incredibly short. Oh yeah, if you have any questions for me, please leave, leave them in the comments below. Regardless, I would really like to get some feedback on what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. <sighs> SCP-11 Sentient Civil War Memorial Statue Should be in like, anyway. <laughs> no. anyway After class, safe SCP-11 and the area surrounding it are to be cleaned once every day for safety purposes Cleaning should start at least 30 minutes before sundown. Cleaning should always be performed by at least two personnel who are advised to note anything unusual about the item or the debris cleaned up. In the situation where the item could not be cleaned for more than two hours, days, local residents must be contacted and instructed not to approach the item. Containment procedures no in 2004. SCP-11 is a Civil War memorial statue located in Woods at Stuck, Vermont. The statue is the image of a young male soldier holding a musket at his side and is carved out of granite. It's quartered within the area. Occasionally, SCP-11 has been observed lifting the, its musket to the, uh, the sky to fire at birds which attempt to look and or defecate on it. Reports detail that its movements produce soft grinding sounds but do not cause it any structural or Failure. Oddly, the gunfire is very similar to that of a standard firearm, despite observations that the item only loads grant bullets and grant powder into the musket, which is also unharmed by the firing. In spite of its efforts, some fecal matter does, does manage to strike SCP-11 and has reportedly become distressed when it has a, a large, large amount of feces on it. On some rare occasions, even firing at humans. Addendum. Those assigned to SCP-11 are to see document and 11-1 for instructions. Document 11-1, maintenance brief. Document archive 2004 accessible to a person with security clearance 2011 or higher. Additional information, SCP-11 seeming sentience has increased since the first report of the activity in 1995. As of 2004, IOS contingent receivers have been dropped but remains under constant and observation. Record right below our landmark event and its activity. Timeline, March 12, 1995. What's that resident reports the statue whose eyes eyes moving. First sign of activity. September 30th, 1995. Statue shoots musket for the first time. October 9th, 1995. Statue begins shooting birds from the sky. January 25th, 1996. Registration as SCP-11. Containment procedures begin. 
April 14th, 1997. SCP-11 and moving casually and looking around. May 3rd, 2000. After caretaker blank jokingly shot out, good shot to SCP-11, the Adam replies, thank you, in a reportedly very human voice. First speech from statue. Okay. October 22nd, 2001. SCP-11 has conversation with caretaker blank. 2001. Shooting at birds. It stops. February 6, 2002. At the employing of blank, SCP-11 steps down from his pedestal. November 10th. Containment procedures is dropped. Custody of SCP-11 transferred to blank. May 17th, 2005. Blank reports that SCP-11 is romantically attracted to her. August 29th, 2006. Most recent psych test reports an IQ of 133. So it's a smart statue, I guess, that shoots at birds for pooping on it. I mean, if you were a statue, you'd probably shoot at birds if they pooped on you too. SCP-2, oh, also known as a bad composition. I have number SCP-12, and I'll be calling it that instead of O-12 because it's easier to say. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-12 is to be kept in a darkened room at all times. If the object is exposed to light or seen by personnel during a light frequency other than infrared, Remove personnel for mental health screening and immediate it physical. The object is to be contained in an iron shielded box, suspended from the ceiling with a room clearance of 2.5 meters or 8 feet from the floor, walls, and any openings. Description SCP-12 was retrieved by archaeologist K.M. Sandoval during the excavation of, of a northern Italian tomb destroyed in a recent storm. The object, a piece of handwritten musical story entitled On, on, on Mount Gog Oda, part of a larger set of sheet music, appears to be incomplete. The red-black ink, first thought to be some form of berry or natural dye ink, was later found to be a human blood from multiple subjects. The first personnel to locate this sheet Site 19 Special Salvage had two members to send into insanity, attempting to use their own blood to finish the composition, ultimately resulting in massive blood loss and eternal trauma. Following initial investigations, multiple set of subjects were allowed access to the score. In every case, the subjects mutilated themselves in order to use their own blood to finish a piece, resulting in subsequent symptoms of psychosis of psychosis and massive trauma. Those subjects who managed to finish a section of the piece immediately committed suicide. I mean, sewer slide. Declaring the piece to be impossible to complete. Attempts to perform the music have resulted in a disagreeable cacophony, with each instrumental part having no correlation or harmony with other instruments. Whew. <sighs> Well, that was gory. Moving on. SCP-13, Blue Lady Cigarettes. M number, SCP-13, Object Class Safe. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-13 you know, is to be kept in a sor secure storage vault at Site-66. Exposed subjects are to be monitored for differences between their symptoms. Exposed subjects are to be interviewed daily, and any changes for perception are to be logged. The 
Description. SCP-13 is the collective designation of a two for 242 cigarettes, which display similar anomalies. The most common external de detail between is, is, is the presence of the words Blue Lady, handwritten on each cigarette in blue ink. Subjects who consume the contents of SCP-13 through inhalation will begin to perceive themselves as a specific unidentified woman. Subjects have described the woman to be aged it's between 25 and 35 year, years old, standing approximately 1.6 meters tall with an estimated weight of between 50 and 55 kilograms. Additional reoccurring details include cropped dark hair, blue eyes, and bright blue lipstick. Immediately after consuming an instance of SCP-13, subjects so will gradually be begin to perceive reflections of themselves as having the features of the woman, and will gradually perceive their bodies changing to reflect her appearance over the course of the following weeks. All changes are entirely mental. The subject's body does not change outwardly, only their perceptions of themselves. These alterations are permanent and cannot be reversed. SCP-13 was discovered after the suicide of Ian Miles, Pack in a large cardboard crate in his apartment. A cursory search of the apartment uncovered several hundred sketches of a figure strongly resembling the one perceived while under 13's effect. Miles' body had been found sitting at a desk, dead of a massive overdose, and draped over a handwritten note transcribed below. During the Investigation of Miles' apartment, one civilian investigator became affected by I-13's effect. An embedded agent soon contacted the nearest site. The subject, the artifact, and real evidence were extracted and contained. Currently, 217 instances of, of SCP-13 in cigarettes are contained at Biosite 66. 25 SCP-13 cigarettes are contained at Research Sector 09. Betting future research into similar anomalous effects. Below is the note which was acquired along with SCP-13. I see her everywhere. The sad, that sad blue lady. I feel like I used to, should know her, but I can't remember. I love her, but I don't know why. She's so beautiful and sweet and clear, but I don't know anymore. My favorite flavor. Where did you go? I miss you. Well. That's kind of interesting. SCP-14. The Concrete... It man. Special containment procedures. SCP-14 is to be kept inside blank in a chair with arms, preferably facing a window. Music should be supplied on a regular basis, preferably constantly. Music should not include pieces originating after 1937. A security camera should be present in SCP-14's room. <coughs> Excuse me. Description. SCP-14 is a Caucasian male appearing to be approximately 30 years of age with black hair, and brown eyes, and a somewhat round face. Records indicate his name to be Robert Chetford, confined in 1950 to Norwich Asylum in Connecticut for delusional insanity, claiming that he had been cursed to live forever and was slowly turning into concrete in consequence. The asylum closed in 1937, and the patients were transferred to various other facilities. SCP-14 came to foundation attention in 19 blank from rumors of a patient who seemed to be entirely immobile and showed no, age, no signs of aging. For an investigation determined that an acquisition was warranted. SCP-14 is, to all outward appearances, a normal man, but he does not appear to age and shows no signs of possessing a metabolism. He does not eat, drink, perspire, or in any way, any other way demonstrate life functions. 
He breathes only to speak. And apart from his eyes and vocal apparatus, it is to all appearances utterly immobile. He has never shown any evidence of pressure ulcers despite his position not having buried for several decades. Neither do his muscles appear atrophied. He can converse normally but shows little knowledge or of or interest in events since his confinement. Note. Frankly, were I to invert this, this man without knowing his history, I think it was a perfectly sane and well-dressed individual who happens to be a quadriplegic. As it is, I have to conclude that he's the ultimate proof of the idea that the mind rules the body. He thinks he's concrete and will live forever, and so he's as close as both to both as he can be somehow. From a doctor that we don't know the name of. SCP-15 Pipe Nightmare Object Class Euclid SCP-15 is impossible to move and is contained on site. A gap of at least 2 meters 6 feet needs to be maintained around the entire destruction or containing in SCP-15. E15 at all times, and no structures of any kind are to make contact with SCP's current containment structure. Exploration is permissible, but only in teams of three, with full safety lines and GPS tracking. Any protrusions from SCP-15 must be capped and sealed immediately, with a new site recorded and logged. No aggressive action is to be made within SCP-15. No hand or power tools are allowed anywhere inside SCP-15. No repairs or maintenance are to be made anywhere on SCP-15. Description SCP-15 is a mass of pipes, vents, boilers, and other various plumbing apparatus as completely filling a warehouse in the blank. The pipes appear to grow when not under observation, attempting to connect with to nearby structures via sewer systems and underground plumbing. SCP-15 contains at current an estimate over 190 kilometers or 120 miles of pipes, ranging in, in diameter from two and a half centimeters to over one meter. Some pipes appear new, while others are rusted and leaking. Pipes have been reported as being made of bone, wood, steel, fresh ass, ash, human flat ash, glass, and granite. No pipes composed of lead, PVC plastic, copper, or any other traditional or material for production of pipes have been found. SCP-15 reacts to tools and aggressions. Any personnel acting violently, carrying tools, or attempting to damage or repair SCP-15 in any way will, will trigger a reaction. Any path of sanity subject will burst, frying on subject for several seconds before the flow suddenly stops. Pipes have been reported containing oil, mercury, rats, a species of insect not yet identified, ground glass, seawater, entrails, and molten iron. Pipes will continue to burst around the subject until death or retreat. SCP-15 was cut back to its current structure after attaching 11 other to 11 other structures in the area. Currently, 11 personnel have been and killed, and 20 more are still missing. Reports have been made of banging and screaming coming from within SCP-15. <sighs> Plumbing. This was stupid. It was a stupid idea thought out of by stupid people in stupid safe offices. Agent 2 looked around slowly, letting his flashlight plague over the walls, and one of the other items the agents were allowed to carry inside SCP-15. Agent 6 and Lon were 
They're standing just behind him, doing the same. The idle chatter and joking had died off about 30 seconds ago. Each agent slowly realized that this was no simple little milk run. Go in, find the observation, you know, pull the data, and recover the unit. Cake, they had laughed. Lon asked if she should find a mar a Mario hat to wear. They mean plumbers now and all. Now ever seeing the dim, cramped tunnel yawning before him, the only joke was them being there at all. Two stepped forward, slowly fixing his flash around the, the ground. It was a hard mat of pipes, more or less level with the floor. A few tubes stuck up, up here and there, snaking around like tree roots, or suddenly turning up in the middle of the floor like a pillar. The walls, the ceiling, every inch of the original structure was coated in pipes. Some reacher who led them up to the main door said there wasn't anything left after the old warehouse, really, except for the outer shell. He pushed away that whole line of thought, pointedly following the pre mounted course it, it had to memorize, stepping around a pillar or of tightly woven hair, the glossy surface steaming gently. Six plotted along, taking the rear and keeping a clear eye on two and Lon. Skish kids. Lon was jumping at every sound, and the two looked like he was ready to drop and run if he saw all so much as a mouse. Kids. He sniffed in the dark, playing his light forward, smelling heat, sewage, and god knows what else. They needed a good military hand to lead them, but damned if Six was going to oh, motley cuddle or grunt on adults who were, were going to jump at shadows. They were going to we'll get this dang job done and get the heck back out. Frick that at BS SCP slip. They were just security blankets for egghead, eggs, and flakes. Semi safety in my butt. They just didn't want people denting their pet horrors. He wanted out of this stripping nightmare. He was going to get the mission done with or without them. <sighs> Lon tiptoed over or a thick, thorny mass of pipe. The surface like braided thistles, trying not to whimper. She he kept close to two, keeping the light at her feet so she wouldn't step on anything nasty. She had wanted to seem even like the little weak girl, but she had a terrible fear of tight spaces. And this place was like walking around in somebody's slowly closing arteries. Lon shook her head, hard, breaking off that whole train of thought. She was a tech. Six and two were to safety. All she had to do was stick by them, pull the data cards out of the MRV, and then leave. She tried not to, she tried hard not to look back at the sealed doors in the distance behind them. Only a couple turns to the MRV, a little work, and then out. In and out, simple as pie. She ignored a softly throbbing pipe of the lever that flashed near her arm, with a focus that was almost physical. They found the MRV after what felt like an hour of walking. It was hard to keep your bearings. The rampant growth of the pipes had cramped some areas down to crawlways and snare but others into random claustrophobic mazes. Six had I nearly gotten stuck twice, and it looked like he was about to murder Lon, on which he made a comment relating to Winnie the Pooh. Lon was talking in at least, but it was brittle a whistle in front of the graveyard chatter. Two kept trying to follow the directions, but even with them being less than a week old, they were little more than in a guideline. When, and they'd finally found the MRV, it had been a military release. At least they were, they were at the halfway point. Then they looked at it in the light. It had been speared, for lack of a better worms, pinned against a pipe. I have some, some kind of dense fabric. A smooth black pipe had dogged itself to the camera lens of the observation vehicle. It wasn't smashed or damaged. It just connected as if it was made for it. It lifted the little tread robot near clean near a foot off the ground and it looked like other smaller pipes had started to connect to other open spaces on the vehicle. It just sat there, the wheel slowly turning as the battery died, like a bug on a nest of pins. Some clear, foul-smelling fluid was dripping softly from the camera housing. Well, his voice echoed in the dark a moment too. 
a monument to pointless speech, they all stood for a few moments. Then Lance all right, to carefully look over the MRV. Six was looking around with an increasing restlessness, starting to mutter quietly. Lon was reaching for the day cards before stopping, looking over at two. Um, two? Since it's grown into the MRV, do you think it counts? What do you mean counts? Two kept the light on her end of the machine. A hiss of steam in behind I am making him flit, inch. I mean, as damaging 15. If I take out the data cards, do you think it will react? Two looked around slowly, shining its light along the floor. A pipe as wide as a car and seemingly made of compacted lint. This suddenly seems like a bad... Oh, shut the freak up! Both agents turned to stare at Six. He'd stepped up to the MRV, flexing his hands and reaching into his kilt with one hand. And the other pushed Lon away, none too softly. Move it. Reaction. For frick's sake. They just say that at, at, at rubbish to who frick with people and keep their toys safe. It's a bunch of weird pipes, beginning and end. There, maybe it grows forever, but uh, the dang thing sure it, as, as heck. I guess I'm going to take offense to people. I'm grabbing the is dang thing, and we're getting out of here. As he spoke, he stepped forward, flipping over. Or the eight apart recover. More of the clear scummy liquid had pulled inside. The other two ooh, agents froze, staring in shock a moment, and the building seemed to do so as well. The whispered sounds of venting steam, sliding materials, and soft pinging had all stopped. The heartbeat in Lund's ears sound like a gunshot. Two side forward reaching for six. Jesus six? What the frick are six ignored him, slipping out the thin and daddy cards. It felt like nasty water had over them bad, but they were built to resist it. He slipped them out, then put the bundle in his pocket, fry along the edge of the camera lens, shifting the MRV a bit, trying to see if it would work free as Sue and Lon backed away. Slowly, the silence around him seemed to crush inward. Six gave up, turning away from the helplessly trapped MRV and shining his light on the two white faced agents. Freaking kids, I don't know how you guys survive. The pipe under him opened with the sound of tearing felt. Two and Lon didn't have time to react before he slid it into the widening gap above to his armpits and started screaming horribly. So this flashlight went tumbling away as the two agents, galvanized by the big man's edge screaming, began to help him. A blast of heat and light was pouring up from under the man as the two agents grabbed his arms and looked down. He was emerged in a massive, thickly flowing molten in glass. His clothes had already started to smolder and burn. The stench of seared flesh almost more overpowering than the re reverberating screams. They pulled and drugged up half a man with a ruined, seared mass of flesh and cloth where his lower body should have been. They panted, trying to drag him, blunt and starting to scream along with six. Two's eyes wide and fixed on some point far away from there. There was a horrible a swell of sound rising all around them, kinging, hissing, clicking, clacking, a pipe to their side, bulging alarmingly and causing them to nearly fall. They regained their footing just as a wooden pipe from above of them burst open in a spray of splinters and clear stinging dust. Two of lawn spun away, gagging and choking, two spitting out a mass of blood, Glass. It was power glass. It poured over six, muffling his screams, shifting as he struggled a few moments, then stopped, the glass quickly covering the body and spreading. Lon blinked, eyes red and puffy, looking over at two. He nodded, and they bowled down the hall, trying to ignore the rising cacophony of sound, sounding like, like an approaching subway train. A mass of oily, reeking chemicals boiled up behind them, a jetting surge of rose thorns nearly cutting off their forward 
or progress, forced them to crawl along on a bone pipe that was shuddering like an old man in the cold. They ran, keeping just be just ahead of whatever it was, and splintering explosions and shivering cracks all around them. They finally came into a snarled crawl way, barely a feet wide. This that was the only way forward. Two dived in and doing a low crawl, tried to whip himself forward like a snake, knowing the passage was only about fifteen feet long, easy. Won't take any time. Lon has it. That tiny black cap looking like a mouth. He saw her sudden and burst of steam behind her sent her aching forward, sobbing as she started to crawl all after two. To ignore the growing vibration all around him, the cracking ping near his head. And it's free of the opening. He turned and saw nothing. No lawn, no sun bursting, just the empty hole. He looked around, hands twitching, thinking, and slid back inside, trying to find the lawn and physically drag her out. He could hear her muffled, probably behind the next turn, and his flashlight revealed a solid wall of three thick, thick, flaking white pipes. This was it. He was sure of it. The tunnel was right here. And then he heard the pitiful scream behind and them. Lon egging, pleading, screaming for him. Two stared, eyes wide, and then slammed, and the splash what against the pipe. Lot it burst, sending a reeking, corrosive slime over his hand, making him real bat act on the crawlway, a screaming as it ate it into his flesh. He stood outside the opening, holding his steaming hand away from him, trying not to look at the exposed bone. Oh, oh Jesus, Lon, Lon, I'm sorry, I'll get help, I'll get someone, just sit tight, I swear. He bolted it down the hall, his flashing seeming to dim in time into the rising sound. Lon panted, screaming for two. Hearing the hard bang on the other side of the pipe and a sudden and shrieking re retreat, she sobbed, her whole body is shaking and start to work her way backward, crawling on her, her belly, crying as she muttered some half-remembered prayer. When her feet pushed against a solid wall of pipe, she couldn't even muster her fresh scream. She was trapped. His face not much bigger than a coffin. Helpless, she sobbed, face on the ground, on the warm, fuzzy pipes, and noticed the silence. Aside from her cries, there was nothing. No pain, no cracks or explosions, nothing. She raised her head in the barely illuminated dark, looking around. She was alive. It was coming down. They had come for her. She would get her help. She was getting out of there. She fought back her growing claustrophobia, looking along the walls. She noticed a small gap in the ceiling and started shifting to give her a look, twisting back and finding only the open end of a pipe. On sagged back, closing her eyes, tears looking down her face. The first sticky strips, drips she assumed were the same tears. Then one fell on her mouth, and it was a sweet. She opened her eyes and saw a thick, equivalent mass of amber goo splattered from the mouth of the pipe, cutting her on the floor as it urged out. She coughed, shifting back. It was honey. Hunting or something like it. At least it wasn't molten lead or acid. Then she saw the level rising. It wasn't draining. The pipes were packed too close. She looked around her tiny chamber with horror arising much faster than the honey oozing up her sides. Lon beat on the walls, the floor, the ceiling, trying to block the pipe with her hands. Heedless of provoking the thing more as the honey. He rose and rose, as quite sweet as a school age lover. Her last gasping breath was sweet and still with honey and s screams. Two ran, totally lost now, his flashlight I dimming by the moment. The sound of crackling and bursting pipes started to trail off. Maybe it was done. Finally. SCP-15 was protected, but it didn't seem vengeful. People had gotten hurt before and gotten out fine. It happened. They found a way to get Lon out, too. 
She might even be out already. Just found another way to get around the blockage. That's probably it. She was out of this stupid place. Six was a shame. But why had uh, that lunatic take over the case? Why ha I the hell? What the heck had possessed him? He was still musing on, on this when he tripped over an unseen pipe in the dark around his feet. He pitched forward, yelping a half-surprised, half-terrified bark as he went sprawling. Or he should have went sprawling. Instead, he fell past the floor, into a yawning open pit of a pipe, the slick oozing sides plunging down at a sharp angle. He screamed, trying to grab something to stop or slow himself, but the walls were oozing and thick. His downward slide gained speed, his dimming flashlights showing a seemingly endless tunnel off below him. He slid and slid, a scum of su inking smooth ooze sticking to his clothes and skin. The tube twisted and banged him against the wall all as he followed it, his flashlight jittering and starting to flicker. Then he screamed down like a fist, to grabbing the light and trying to keep it still, pleading with it, staring at the lamp bulb as it dimmed more and more. It surged for a moment, then flickered out, darkness pressing into his eyes like cloth. The agent slipping down faster and faster, screaming until oh, he was hoarse, screaming until his throat bled, screaming even as he passed well beyond the physical boundaries of that tangled web of pipes. Days later, when his skin started to shred off, it was almost welcome. SCP-15 Recovery Report Agent 2, Missing in Action Agent 6, missing in action. Agent Lon, missing in action. MRV 889236 status, unrecovered. Data deemed non-vital in light of lost staff. SCP-15 classification level review suggested. And this has been SCP-10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Read to you by Haku. I hope you enjoyed. Please leave a like and a comment and, uh, and subscribe to the channel. And please ask me questions. I would love to hear them. I'll see you next time.